Now we're going to read this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 1. And I think I'll begin reading verse 29. something, right? And if you were part of the inner circle, you would likely feel quite the opposite. So I guess a better name for the message today would be an invitation to the Lord's inner circle. Um, In the world that we live in, there are millions and billions of inner circles. Um, We have a number of them likely ourselves. You likely have a family circle that, not even just the technical family circle, like you and your spouse and your children, but, um, you know, there's often a a circle that is just the closest group of family that you have. And to some, it may seem strange. You might throw a first cousin in there and say, I'm closer to my first cousin than I am a brother. Or... It may be some unique variation of things and say, you know, that's, that's my family circle. That's my hearth. That's the core of it right there. Likely you have a friend circle where you've got a larger one and then you've got an inner circle. Um, I think you all get the point. Millions and billions of circles, and we're all subject to work circles and all of those. And the Lord has an inner circle. The Lord has an inner circle. It's a unique one. It is not in any way exclusive or determined to be exclusive. Now, like any inner circle... There are expectations for those that are in it, right? So I guess in that way it's exclusive. But when I say it's not exclusive, what I'm meaning is that God has not predetermined ahead of time, well, I just don't get along with you, you're not invited. I just don't, we don't mesh, right? Those are words and phrases and thoughts that we often express about friendships that we have, family that we might have. Um, The Lord invites everyone to be part of his inner circle. Now, lest we remain too... um, vague... I'm not just talking about being saved. So, I'll state from the very beginning, and this message may go back and forth to some degree. I don't really know. Um, If you're going to be part of the Lord's circle, you have to know Him. That's just common sense, right? Like any any inner circle that you're part of, you've got to know the people. Or else they're not part of your circle. So we'll establish as a baseline right at this moment that to be part of the Lord's circle, any, you have to personally know him. But one of the things that has disheartened me very greatly over the years about the churches that I've worshipped in is that 
they've seemed to make the aim just being part of a circle of the Lord's. Or just barely scraping it into heaven. Right? That I've really made it in life if I just get to heaven. And I just barely, and we have, I think, songs. I don't know anything about the song. All I know as a kid is I'd flip through the songbook. Maybe we have it in a songbook. I've not looked at it, so I'm not hating on it. But all I want is like a log cabin in the corner of heaven. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Maybe you probably read it. You probably never sang it, but you probably read it. Maybe you have sang it. And it's, it's kind of putting this point forward. And I think in one way, there's nothing wrong. It's expressing humility, right? I'd rather be in the, a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. And maybe that's how the song goes. I have no idea. Um, but I think it can also express this notion that, you know what, as, as long as I'm making it in there, barely, I'm good. That's a really damaging mentality to have. It's a damaging thought to think that the goal the Lord has for you is just to get you saved. That is not true. And we're going to spend the next 17 weeks and Wednesday nights talking about how that's not true. About how God's goal for your life is not to just get you scraping it into heaven barely. That you're sitting on the outside of heaven and the bouncer's there and there's a list called the Lamb's Book of Life and you're just crossing your fingers hoping you're on the list. God has more for you. And I think Satan has cleverly deceived cleverly deceived the dynamics within a church to make the things going on here weighty obligations that we have to guilt out of guilt carry out. Brother Brad won't drop this Wednesday night thing. No, I won't. I won't drop it. I'm not going to drop it. And it's not because I'm just trying to saddle you with the weight of guilt. It's because I have no hesitation telling you you're missing out. You are. Not because I'm involved, not because there are specific people or some kind of a a neat little club that we've got started, but God is bringing people into his inner circle in their hearts. God is accomplishing in the heart things, necessary things in this life that unlock keys to people's hearts and minds, truths that have been mysteriously hidden that are significant stumbling blocks in life at every age that God through his Holy Spirit As we're out there saying, you know what, I just don't understand and I'm struggling through this. All the while, God is offering a key. Like, think of the visual here. What if what is occurring is this? You're struggling and doubt is pervasive in your heart and confusion and you're not sure what to do in life and you're you're just struggling. And all the while, your pastor's nagging. Wednesday nights, man. Come and engage in a deep study of the truth. And you're like, man, I'm feeling really guilty for coming, not coming. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm saying is I know over time that God, through the power of his Holy Spirit and the inspiration of his word, will offer you the very things you stand most in need of. And so, didn't plan on saying this this morning, but it's just a matter of fact. The strange duality of sitting here begging God for help, and all the while it's been offered in a place that you're just not accessing. Think about that, please. Just consider it. Because what we're going to talk on Wednesday night is about the call to discipleship. Which is the call of God in the scriptures. 
The call of salvation is implicit in the call of discipleship. Or in other words, it's an understood facet of the true call of God to discipleship. See, what God is not simply wanting to do, it's, it is an incomplete depiction of God's will and his call to stop at saying God wants everyone to be saved. Now, don't get me wrong. There's many places in Scripture where God highlights that. But if you were to ask the broad question, what does God call mankind to? And the only answer was just to get saved. That's not wrong. It's incomplete. It's incomplete. And I've never been more convinced of that than since January, having been conflicted in my own heart about it. It feels like there's more here that I'm not seeing. That the denomination I've grown up in has been so justifiably emphatic about the true call to salvation. Why is that? Well, because the world at large has perverted it and they've made it a mental decision. And so you just come forward and I shake your hand and say, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that he died for your sins? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, now you have salvation. And because that aspect of salvation has been perverted, all the attention of God's people has come in protecting this valuable pillar of truth. But there's a danger in overemphasizing incomplete revelation. Or in other words, there's more there. There's more. And I want you to know this morning, Jesus wants you to be part of his inner circle. Now, I'm going to say something that can, can, it's going to risk You can think bad things about me, okay? It's going to risk that, but I feel like I need to say it. Of all things over the last few years that I have desired, it is to be part of God's inner circle. Like if there is an ambition. Now, I feel the need for a moment to express what I'm not saying. Not because I want some... Special standing. To be like some special person in God's little army. You know, and so you get the little badge and you get the, oh, you're a colonel now. Now you're moved up. Now you're a general. Now, no, 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 no. So throw that out of your mind. That's not what we're talking about this morning. Status is not invoked here. It's not concerned here. I'm talking about being a part of the Lord's inner circle, being privy to the heart of God directly. So there's all these layers in religion today, and and there's such a perversion in our world, and it has been since the beginning, excuse me, that mankind has brought, has projected this idea, for example, that there's lay members, and there's deacons, and then there's preachers. That's a lie. Do you know that? If you don't know that, I'm I'm here to tell you now. That's a complete lie to keep you away from God's inner circle. That's, That's what it is. They want you to think that, hey, I have some special spiritual anointing that gives me the special access to God's presence that you are not privy to. You say, well, Brother Brad, I thought you said you've been called to preach. I have. There's a call that is unique to a minister to accomplish a certain task that God has designed to be accomplished. But I could say to each one of you, has God called you to be a disciple? And your answer would be, hopefully, yes. And we find all through the scriptures 
We don't find this delineation where God says in any place, I would challenge anybody to say, to find a place where the Bible says, I have a tier system of who can be in my inner circle as part of the body. No, it says God distributes gifts to the body. And you go to Ephesians chapter 4, and it lists out all of these gifts. And some of them, there's a whole number of them. You can go look there yourself. And one of them is ministry and teaching. But even in that text, it doesn't say, now here are the regular gifts, and then here are the really special ones. It doesn't say that. So God gives you this invitation I want you to be in my inner circle. I want you to know the mind and the heart of God. And and, and, and the book of John, chapter 1, is just this, it's so good. There's just no way that I'll be, when we we studied on Wednesday night, there was no way we could get to it all. No way we can get to it all. I'm going to do a 30,000 foot view today of what's going on here. Because John probably has my favorite start to any book in the whole Bible. It starts at this lofty place and almost has a a philosophical slant to it. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And so it gets this play on meaning with the word word. And it's meant to reference Jesus. And it begins to tell us from this kind of a distance a view of God's eternal plan in Jesus Christ towards mankind. So the word became flesh. He dwelt among us. He was sent to his own people. His people rejected him. It kind of gives us this distant view. And then, like, here's how I describe it. The outer circle. The impersonal, big picture of God's plan is what's depicted in those first 17, 18 verses. And then we step into that circle, and God draws a little smaller circle. And there are a few more details that are involved. God says, there's this man who was prophesied in the Old Testament named John the Baptist. He was different than everybody else. And he was going out. Matthew chapter 3 tells us the events of these things. And so you can go read that for yourself. John, being the last gospel written, doesn't give us all the specific details because he already knew what was written in those other synoptic gospels. So there's a man sent from heaven whose name was John, John the Baptist. And the Bible predicted that he was going to come and kind of pave a path for Jesus. Or in other words, prepare for his coming. So in a sense, imagine you've seen no doubt when the president walks into the rotunda of the, the, the House of Representatives is going to give the, United, or the, the State of the Union address. There's somebody that comes out and announces him, now introducing the president of the United States, whoever it may be. That was the role of John the Baptist. He came, and so Jesus is describing, or rather the author John here is describing a separate person from John the Baptist, is describing here... There was a man sent from heaven whose name was John. He was prophesied about in the Old Testament. And he came to announce to the world, God is coming. The Messiah is coming. Now, if I told all of you that this Wednesday, next Sunday morning, Jesus was going to be here in bodily form. And I went around Likely, if I found out he was coming, I would call everybody that I know. Jesus is going to be here. You got to get here. You got to get here early. That was what John the Baptist did. He's announcing God is here. You got to come and see him. And it tells us within this that he went around, and, and these people, these religious people, That was a strange thing because he was not a typical messenger. I mean, the only way to put John is he was strange. He was just strange. Didn't wear the suit. Didn't live the normal, per se, life. Didn't fit into the cultural context of religion, which, by the way, a disciple never does. But man, he is just... 
He's in God's inner circle. So he's just going and he's announcing to the world all these things about Jesus coming. But he hasn't seen him yet. His own eyes. So he's telling all these people, hey, we need to get ready. Starts baptizing people. Does all these things to prepare for Jesus' arrival. And then one day, Jesus shows up. I love the visual that at least I draw from this first part is that everybody is looking to John. The Levites and the priests from Jerusalem were sent by the religious establishment to go to John. They're like, hey, who are you? What are you doing? Are you the Christ? Are you the one that's supposed to come? And that can often happen today is that oftentimes people have a central focus on religion or preachers. Not a big fan of YouTube preachers myself. Not a big fan of the American pastor concept, right? Where you have these famous pastors, these famous people, and I'm a follower of X. Because very often what happens with those well, often beginning well-intentioned men is all the attention and all the, the things begin to stroke their ego and, and Satan takes an opportunity to lift them up in pride and they begin to then think of themselves and their ministry and their churches as the thing. It's a slippery slope there. So here John the Baptist is ministering and all these people are coming out to him. And John the Baptist does not care about any of it. The moment Jesus shows up, he says, look at that guy. It tells us in, later in the verses, it says that he had disciples of his own. John the Baptist did. So Andrew, which is Peter's brother, was one of those disciples. We don't know who the other one is talking about here in John chapter 1. So what that means is they were students of John the Baptist. So they can tell he's a teacher come from God. They're very mesmerized and overcome with what he's teaching because it's firing in their hearts as compared to everything else. His heart is set ablaze. And John the Baptist is preaching and he's sent by God and it's evident that God is with him. And the moment that the opportunity arises... For John the Baptist to call his followers to the feet of Christ, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Go follow him. Don't follow me. You know what I love? One of the things that I love about a pastor's office is for a while when there's a, 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 a sincere, a person's been saved, I've told you before, many of you, I, I've preached it before, my favorite church member ever, what became my brother-in-law, Because here's what happened in that dynamic. Grew up in a Catholic household. Grew up believing devoutly those things, practicing those things. Gets saved. Begins to question everything about his life. Begins to commit his heart to the word. Begins to seek God. I want truth. Show me. Show me what is right. And there for a while I became a pseudo pastor and he would come to me all the time with questions and we'd spend hours and hours and hours talking about the scriptures, talking about the truth. And then suddenly he began to drift away from me. But not in a bad way, in the right way. You know why? He began to follow Jesus. The word itself was not a book that just established some static truth that he wanted to believe the right creedal statement or doctrines. The word became the word of life. It became the bread of life. And the more that he began to eat and taste and see that the Lord was good, the less my instruction tasted well to him. Why? He was stepping out of my circle and into God's inner circle. Suddenly, I would just watch him in church. I'd watch him preach. Man, he's talking to the Lord. Oh, his sermons were still real short, 10, 15 minutes. You know, they were real short. But I can recognize that a lot of times when you first start out preaching, you're, you're so concerned about what people think that you, you kind of get all your notes out and you, you do all this studying and 
what am I going to say after this? And what point am I going to make after this? That's kind of how you prepare it first. And you get up and it feels awkward and you're, you're not got the public speaking thing set up yet. And, and you're just kind of delivering, conveying this fact. Right? Almost like from an encyclopedia. And then, when a man really begins to pursue the Lord, it can be just a short 10 or 15 minutes. It can be some of the same words, some of the same thoughts. But you can tell that the Lord sparked it. He'd been with the Lord. I remember watching this happen. I probably shouldn't say this because we're recorded, but with Cooper de Graffenried here at the church on a Sunday night. First time he preached, awkward young preacher. Second time he preached, I could just see a spark. There was something. Depth of the sermon, same. But there was a spiritual dimension that was being conveyed. Lasted for just a minute. It was gone. I thought, okay, he's on the right track. Because you're beginning to realize it's not about being in in this little club. It's not about being thought well of people. It's about getting in the Lord's inner circle. That's what it's about. John the Baptist. Then Jesus comes on the scene. What I love about the Gospel of John is John the Baptist disappears. Just like it ought to be. He just disappears. And from that point forward... About Christ. Now, here's the interesting thing. So, John says, and I'm, I'm summarizing it, so you can go back. I may not end up reading a lot of this, summarizing a lot of this. So, you can go back and read John chapter 1 and see if what I'm telling you is true. So, then these disciples, John the Baptist says, Well, you go follow him. Go, go see what he's about. Go see if he is who I'm saying he is. So, they start following Jesus from a distance. I just love the visual there. It's what a lot of times we do. We get saved. We're, our, our interest is piqued about spiritual things. But I don't know. It just seems something a little off about it. I'm going to follow from a distance. I'm going to keep... Like, I may come and ask the preacher, like, a really simple question. I may go ask my family member a simple Bible question, but I don't want to be like a religious weirdo. You know, I don't want to get in that... Uh, I don't want that. Maybe that would suffice with John the Baptist, but if you get close to Jesus with a sincere question and you listen to his answer, there's something compelling about that man more than any other man. So they're following him from a distance. And finally, Jesus says, what are you doing? They're saying, well, we just want to see where the Messiah lives. And here's what I love about what Jesus says. Three words. Come and see. And that's the invitation to you and I. What a beautiful introduction to this book. What a beautiful thesis statement to this book. Because what the book of John is about in many ways, what emanates, one of the themes that emanate from the gospel of John is that Jesus goes to all sorts of people in all sorts of circumstances. And he's bidding them to come And be one of his in the most intimate way possible. And so we read in John chapter 3 of the religious man Nicodemus. Who had all of these religious biases, religious pride and all these faults about him. But he sincerely wanted to know God and truth. And he knew that Jesus was somebody. There was something about who he was and what he said that was compelling. And he wanted to know more about him. And so he comes to him under night because perhaps he's embarrassed and doesn't want to be associated with him. But he truly wants to know. And he takes that step. And he says, I'm going to come and I'm going to see what is Jesus about really? And we read from John chapter 3, what is it, verse 5, all the way down to the end of the chapter. Not quite to the end of the chapter. Jesus is just personally answering all the direct questions of Nicodemus' heart. That's what I love. Now, I want to pause for a moment and say this. One of the wonderful things about the God that is revealed in his holy word is that not only is God this omnipotent, omniscient, bigger than the universe being, but he's also super personal. 
Like God, not, and when I say personal, I don't mean like he's personable. I mean he lives and dwells and is in your presence and knows your thoughts and the intents of your heart more than anybody, anything else, even more than you. God is a personal God. And so this walk, this relationship is not based on shallow platitudes. It's not based upon some, uh, 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 you know, God knows a little things about me, but no, God has been there every single moment of my life since conception, knows everything about my past, knows everything about my thoughts, knows everything about every atom of my being and every cell in my body, knows everything about what's going to occur the remainder of my life and all the ups and all the downs. God is a personal God who only knows that, but has entered into that in me. So God... Jesus reveals, he starts John chapter 1 and he says to these men, come and see where I live. In John chapter 3, he allows, so there he allows, you would think, okay, that makes sense. Like John the Baptist was the forerunner, he was the holy guy, he had two disciples. So of course God's going to invite religious people to come into his inner circle. And then you go to John chapter 3, you're like, okay, you know, Nicodemus was wrong with his religion, but he had a lot of good religion. And so it makes sense that God would invite some religious leader to be part of his, right? Those are preachers. And then John chapter 4 completely destroys that whole idea. Because then Jesus goes to this outcast woman who is known to be a sinner. And he says to her, come and see. Come be a part of my inner circle. So for all of this, it has been painted by our culture that somehow Christianity has some preference of men over women. And women are this marginalized group that that Christians, that fundamentalist Christians are striving to keep out. Well, doesn't John chapter 4, when Jesus purposely redirects his route and goes somewhere a little bit further to get to because he was going to a city where this outcast woman would be because he wanted her to have an invitation to be part of his inner circle. So I say to the ladies today, your husband's walk with the Lord, you're not sitting and riding on his coattails. That's not what Christianity is about. It's not what Jesus requires. God wants to have an intimate personal, purposeful, meaningful relationship and purpose for your life as much as he does for mine. And he wants you to be part of his inner circle just as much as he calls me to be part of his inner circle. He invites you. Come and see what all this is about. That woman, at least in salvation, she got to be part of his circle. Even the first person to the tomb was a marginalized, sinful, outcast woman. Mary Magdalene. Why? Because the Bible teaches us, especially in the New Testament, God does not differentiate value and who he wants on his inner circle based upon your gender, based upon your ethnicity, based upon any of those things that we categorize people. Does God have different roles for different people? Absolutely. But in the sense of value and whom God wants to be an intimate follower with him, it's universal. John chapter 8, the adulterous woman, whom he called. John chapter 9, you say, you know what? I don't think we have people like that here, but I could very easily see you know, somebody saying, well, I have a a physical debilitation that prevents me from being a meaningful part of God's kingdom and inner circle. You know, maybe I I don't have the use of my legs, and maybe I'm blind, and maybe I'm whatever. So, for all the, quote, normal people, they have access to the inner circle. But I don't. Again, John chapter 9 kind of blows that one out of the water, right? Because a blind man born from birth... God says, Jesus says, that God had ordained his blindness from birth so that the works of God might be manifest or shown in him. So God had designed that man. 
broken, as we call it, as we think of it, so that God's work could be done and manifested through him. And you and I will never make it into the inner circle he was in being recorded with a personal interaction with Jesus being written into God's holy and inspired word. But that man did because God had a purpose for him, because God loved him, and because in the very beginning of John, he gives this this statement that he says, come and see what I'm about. Come and dwell, see where I dwell. So, you know, if you go to the White House, you have to, I think, get like FBI background approval now to be able to go to the White House. You show up at the White House. Oh, they give you a tour of the White House. You don't see where the president lives. They might point to the door of his office, or the door of his residence, but they take you to all the places that are, are not useful. The museum on the premises. They don't invite you to the war room. They don't invite you to the residence. They don't write you to share your burdens and thoughts with the actual president. And if you meet the president, it's not purposeful, it's coincidental. He just happened to be there and he's going to try to get your vote. So he stops and says, hi, I'm the president. Thanks for coming today. But here's what I love about John chapter one and what it expresses. Andrew and them from a distance followed Jesus. He finally turns around and says, what are you doing? And they said, we just want to see where you live. And he says, well, come and see, come on in. And it was evening time. So they just stayed the night with him. God invited people for a sleepover. Come, be with me, see who I am. Then here's the interesting thing that happens. Andrew leaves the next day. It says on the next day, he runs to his brother. I found him. I found the Messiah. I found it. It's really him. The prophet that has been prophesied about all this time. It's him. I know it. I've been in his house. I've dwelt with him. I've, I've, I've feasted with him. I stayed with him. I know it's him. You know what he says to Peter? Come and see. Come and see him. He invites everybody to come. Now, on its surface, Andrew's statement was pretty absurd, really. I mean, this, this, this Messiah figure had been prophesied about for 4,000 years. So, man, he's got this, you know, this shadowy silhouette. This, he's a shadowy, I know, figure, mysterious. But the assumption was he's going to come like a king, blazing with his sword, fighting, and X, Y, and Z. And so for, like, my ragtag fisherman brother... My younger brother, who's an idiot from my perspective, coming and saying, I found God on earth. Pretty silly, right? About as silly as a preacher in Old Union in Bowling Green saying, hey, there's more to God than what you're seeing. There's more to life than just skating into heaven barely. He's worth living for and dying for and spending every breath for his glory. He said, ah, that's a little extreme, isn't it? I don't know. Like, I mean, he's, I'm thankful for my blessings. So I periodically want to say, God, thank you for my blessings. But even that, it's like dwelling in the shallow kiddie pool of thanks, thanksgiving. You know the least things I'm thankful for are my material blessings? I'm thankful for them. That's the least of what I'm thankful for. The things I'm really thankful for are the spiritual things about him. Those are the rich things. But a kid values Disney World more than a home. Right? Like an immature Christian values my house more than my personal fellowship with the creator of the universe. But you grow a little and you realize, you know what? I'd rather dad save his money and pay our rent than to take us on this big, luxurious vacation. And that's the growth of a Christian as you get closer and closer to the Lord's inner circle. You begin to realize, you know what? 
I'm actually most thankful, thankful for things that don't even involve me. What? Like even the spiritual things that don't even involve me. That are just about him. Like I'm just thankful that he's a God of mercy. Whether I ever taste his mercy or not. I'm just thankful that's who he is. I'm just thankful he's a God of grace and love. I'm just thankful that God is perfectly just. Whether all of those things, the rays of God's blessings, ever rest upon me, I'm just thankful for him. Who he is. Jesus gives this invitation. Come. Come and see who I am. Peter goes and takes him up on the offer. And he goes close to Jesus. Now, I say this and you may laugh, but I mean it seriously. It's really, really dangerous to get close to the Lord. It's really dangerous to get close to the Lord. It's dangerous to hear truth. Most dangerous thing you'll do all week, hear the truth. Why? Why is it dangerous to hear the truth? Because then God calls you to obey it. You're accountable for it now. You can't not know anymore. So why are there times when people will be studying their Bible and God reveals something in his word to them and they set it down and they're like, oh, whoa, whoa. We often say things like, that got close to home. If we really unwind what that means, it means this. God has revealed an obligation. of God's revealed he's calling me to something. I don't really want to go there. That's hard to digest. That's why hearing the truth is so dangerous. That's why just casually think when we pick up our Bible and we start reading, and that just comes from the non-committed, sanctified, diligent heart. But the man who seeks to build on the rock... Dangerous, Because he says, if this is the rock, I have to build here. I have no choice. It's what God's called me to do. All right, so the closer we get to the Lord and the more we know him. In our culture today, less and less people are in the Lord's inner circle. You know that? So your behavior looks weird. To even the religious, even the churchgoer, even the member on old union's rolls. But all the while, you forget all that. And you just fix your eyes on Jesus. And you get closer to him and you're like, yeah, but I'm just telling you. There's something about walking towards him that is changing me. Want more. And here's the beauty of it. Andrew didn't say, hey, trust me, that's the Messiah. So I, I say to you this morning, don't trust me. Okay? Put it to the test. Put it to the test. Set your heart to seeking God alone, wanting to know Him alone. And all the things become second. And see if what I'm not telling you is true. That the closer you get to him, and the more that his glory fills your eyes and fills your heart, the more you have no interest in doing anything else but following him. That's the invitation to discipleship. It's not laying upon you a series of do's and don'ts. A disciple is a student and a follower. Not of a certain religion. Not of a certain path designed by man. It's it's following the man, Christ Jesus. Who is alive and reigns and interacts personally with each of us. And you begin to touch the hem of his garment, and you begin to hear the glories and the profoundness of his words in your heart, and he calls, and he calls, 
And you inch closer. And the cost is only worth being paid the more the glories that you see. I mean, that's basic common sense, isn't it? As you benefit from something more, you're willing to pay more for it. So these men, they laid down their nets and they followed him. Fascinating. We'll talk about it a little Wednesday night. The first words Jesus says, ever says to Peter, follow me. In the middle of the Gospels, six to nine months before Jesus' crucifixion, and one year after he has called the twelve, Jesus teaches them, if any man follow me, let him take up his cross, deny himself. No, excuse me. If any man will come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, and follow me. And he puts this in the middle, this offer. He says, you still want to follow me? Or in other words, this is how I think the intention of that is. At the beginning, we're all enthusiastic when we don't know the path, right? I want to be a doctor. And then you're like in the third year of your, your, your bachelor's, and you're taking that class, and you're like, I don't know that I want to be a doctor, Right? Maybe just being a CNA is okay, right? Because the path just got tough. And that's kind of what Jesus does as he's going through his ministry, you'll notice, is that he calls everybody to follow him. And then the path begins to narrow, and it begins to get more hard, and the cost and sacrifice and the losing of self gets higher. And he pauses, he says, you want to follow me? The Bible says in John chapter 6, many of his disciples went away because his saying was hard so he just left interestingly enough he says it a lot more times throughout the gospels he gets to the end very end book of John 21st chapter one of the last things that all the gospels tell us is an interesting interaction that Jesus had with Peter I won't go through all the details here's what I'll get to at the very end he says to Peter Peter, last words of the whole Bible that Jesus speaks to Peter that we know of. Peter, follow me. Now, talk about it Wednesday night. One of the funny things about what Peter does. What Jesus had just been telling him started to sting. It was hurting. And so Peter, it's kind of how we are. It's like, I want to know the truth, but the moment the truth starts to sting, don't tell me anymore. It's what Peter does. The Lord is hitting him with some hard truth. Really hard truth. And all of a sudden, Peter abruptly is like, well, what about John? Not you, John, but John, right? What about John? In other words, let me deflect this truth. Now let's hear what you have to say to this guy. And here's what Jesus' response was. Who cares if I let him tarry until I come back thousands of years later, you follow me. So you might look at some of your other churchmen. They've got an easy life. They've got it this way. Well, what about them, Lord? They're not obeying. Who cares about them? Who cares about them in that sense, right? Comparative sense. The question remains is this. Do you want to be in the Lord's inner circle or not? This morning, I didn't think it was going to go this way, but that's okay. I invite you to be part of the Lord's inner circle. Not that I'm there. Paul told us that. Not that I have already attained, but I press towards the mark of the high calling of Christ to apprehend that for which I was apprehended. Or in other words, I was designed, I was grabbed a hold of to be part of his inner circle. I don't think I've got there yet, but I press towards it. I want to be this morning. Please don't mistake me. Please don't. I've not. If it has come off as an arrogant rant, please nullify all that. I want to invite you to come be a disciple of the Lord. Follow him. 
You say, Brother Brett, how? 17 weeks. We're going to talk about how. We're going to talk about how. I hope today the beauty, the beauty of the Lord to let you learn for yourself, let me learn for myself with nothing in between me and my Savior. You don't have to take my word for it. You can get in the presence of God. You ever done that before? You ever opened up the Bible, reading, and literally said, Lord, what does this mean? How does this apply to me? There's something here. There's something here that hits me. Something here that when I read it, I can't just keep going. What is it, Lord? That's how you study your Bible. You don't just say, I'm going to do five chapters in a day and call it. No, no, no. You go to it. You start reading it. And all of a sudden, the Lord says, hey, stop, look. And you look at it and you say, okay, I understand the surface meaning of it. But I'm guessing you didn't have me stop here because that was it. What else? What am I not seeing? What am I not understanding? And isn't the beauty of it is that the Lord can tell you? That he can show you. Oh, yeah, he may use Brother Ron as your Sunday school teacher, Brother Danny as your Sunday school teacher, me as your... He may use means, but there comes a point where God speaks directly to the heart. And then you don't go around postulating theories about what things mean, trying to prove God's word right. In your heart, God has revealed it. So it no longer is about your pride in proving a point. It's that you get to rest in the certainty of God's word. By the way, that was just a snapshot of how to become a disciple. Studying his word. How to study his word. I hope. I hope the Lord will speak to your heart. I hope that whatever you do with our midweek service, any other service, is immaterial to the desire to become a disciple. And I, I pray today you would have a desire to be a part of the Lord's inner circle and have that advantage of being with him.